This is Trepwire Week in Review for week ending February 11th, 2022. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Henry, Head of Syrian Advisory Services. This week, states lift mask mandates as Omicron fades, and Americans have ramped up their spending in recent weeks. In economic news, markets reacted to a January inflation number that was 7.5% year over year, the highest in 40 years. Jobless claims fell more than expected, and Treasury yields climbed with the 10-year surpassing 2%. Manis, what were you looking at the last couple of days? Well, what I was looking at was probably what everybody was looking at today, which was that alarming CPI number. The print today was 7.5%, which was above consensus estimates somewhat. Uh, Consensus estimates were 7.3%, but clearly this rattled the markets right from the get-go. So uh, the print came out at 8.30. Shortly thereafter, treasury yields started to spike. Equities started to really tumble. Stocks kind of made a stand mid-morning and fought back to even. And then from there, it was kind of that WKRP, you know, wet bag of cement falling from the helicopter type of uh, day. All the major indexes lower. But I think the takeaway from today was a 10-year up 10 more basis points. It finished around 205. A lot of people were concerned about surpassing that 2% level, thinking that was going to trigger all kinds of algo macro trading and and lead to an even bigger sell-off. I don't think that's what we saw today. I think what we saw was people thinking that this 7.5% number puts a 50 basis point rate hike in play for March when the Fed gets together the next time. But even though the, the headline tomorrow will be highest inflation rate in 40 years and 7.5% inflation, those will be the headlines, and headline three will be the 2% treasury rate. The biggest thing for me was the two-year. The two-year yield was up almost 30 basis points today at one point. It closed up 25 basis points, so it opened the day at 136, closed at about 161, and it wasn't all that long ago people were getting 10 basis points for that bond. I mean, it is 150 basis points higher than where it was a year ago and probably 140 or 130 basis points above where it was six months ago. And, you know, that is telling you that people think that this inflation thing is the story and it's not going away. You know, I I think that that's going to be the focus for investors between now and the next time the Fed meets. So with inflation, the big focus, Lonnie, how likely is it that commercial real estate property owners absorb higher costs versus passing them on? Yeah, I think this is a delicate balance. I mean, everyone from the CRE perspective is going to try to pass on as much as they can, but I think depending on property type and depending on where we're at in the cycle, it's going to be more challenging for some than others. If you look at multifamily, you know, the rent acceleration and rent growth that we've seen over the last couple of years, combating some of this inflation, um, they've not really seen any downside to this at this point. Mm-hmm. Hotels, probably a little bit easier to pass some of that on. Um, they can also mitigate some of their expenses in the form of providing less services. So if you've been in a hotel lately, you're seeing less uh, room service in terms of uh, changing the bed sheets, you know, asking you to conserve towels, trying to minimize that exposure to absorb maybe some of that inflation on their side. So I was reading on Twitter last night, there was a post in Austin. So if you're on the new construction side of the house, I think it's going to be really hard to pass all of this on. There was a residential uh, poster on there that said they got bids for lumber for a construction project in December. It was like $35,000 for the project. They they went to place the order yesterday and it was about $70,000. So I don't know how as a developer, you know, you're able to pass all that directly on to your consumers, especially on the commercial side where rental rates and other things are a function of the broader market and not necessarily for that one particular project. So I think uh, they'll pass it on until the consumers push back and say no more. Um, and so we'll, I don't know if we're there yet or when we'll get there, but I think at this point, something for us to continue to keep an eye on. We have a couple of challenges here on the apartment side, right? Number one is when we, when we're at the base of this period of time, when 
rents started to go up dramatically, what we had was a situation where people were flush. The government was writing an awful lot of checks. There was a lot of liquidity in the system. People hadn't started to kind of reflect new building starts yet to balance out what was just a really on fire market at this point. And now you go a year ahead and what you have is no more government checks. So there's not as much liquidity as there was. You have more properties coming online or at least being talked about uh, either kicking off or have already kicked off and, and are going to add to inventory. But the third part of that is that the people that were flush a year ago are now not just not getting checks, they're also paying more for gas, food, and everything else. So it will be a headwind, I think, for people that were counting on those 8, 10, 12% year over year uh, rent hikes for their two and three bedroom apartments in the Southwest and the Southeast and you know these, these hot markets. I, I think that over time, uh, there could be some disappointment there, especially from guys that have purchased properties with like a you know, three and a quarter cap, something yeah, like that. If they're buying properties at a three, three and a quarter cap rate and underwriting 7%, 10% rent increases over the next five years, I think there's going to be some challenges there. So that'll play out in the marketplace, you know, over the next couple of years. But I, I think some developers are still, or some acquisition folks are still bullish long-term, um, but there may be some short to medium-term headwinds if those rent uh, accelerations don't actually come to fruition. So, Manus, have you been watching the Olympics? I have not. I, you know, between the time differential, I don't like watching things on tape delay. I don't get, I don't like getting up at odd hours. So, you know, it, it just, it doesn't do it for me. Although I have to say one of my bucket list items ever since I was probably eight, I've always wanted to try that luge. That looks like Ooh, the funnest yeah. thing in the, in the world, going down yeah. on your back on that thing at 60 miles an hour. With a helmet, please. Yes, absolutely. Well, for most Americans, the Super Bowl is where the excitement is, unless, of course, you are a Los Angeles hotel owner. And the reason is you've only got one traveling team that's going to be needing hotel stays. Well, you got a couple of headwinds there. First of all, Cincinnati is not the biggest city out there. It's not like you're drawing from fans from Chicago or New York, right? It's, you know, I don't know where it ranks in the list of top MSAs, but I'm not sure it's even in the top 30 or 40. So you have a smaller fan base to begin with. And Los Angeles, you know, I'm not sure football is all that popular to begin with out there. They've lost teams several times over the years for other places. And of course, their loyalties are divided. You have the 49ers and the Chargers and the Rams. So, I, you know, I don't think that this will be the home run you, you would have had if it was perhaps the Steelers and the Giants or the Cowboys and the Steelers or something like that, where you have bigger cities and fan bases that tend to travel just in, in just huge numbers. Those Pittsburgh fans are really something like I've never seen before. You know, you could be traveling through Jacksonville on some Sunday in uh, October and the whole city is taken over by, by Steeler fans. It's really Stiller. An amazing they say uh, stiller in the city because I've I've also lived in Pittsburgh. So drink your Iron City light and bring your terrible towel and root for the Stillers. Yeah, we haven't heard from uh, Steel City Dave in a long time. We'll have to a couple weeks. Couple weeks. I think he's probably still in mourning from uh, his team watching Ben Roethlisberger retire and and yeah. and not really have a great season. So Steel City Dave, if you're out there, you know, phone home. Well, I, I would add, I saw a meme this week. This is the first time in the NFL history where the host team is playing both the, the NFC Divisional you know, Championship game and the Super Bowl back-to-back -back weeks in their home stadium. And as you mentioned, Martha, the hotel owners are probably not that excited about this. So the meme was they decided they're going to host all future Super Bowls at uh, Jerry Jones Stadium here in Dallas since the Cowboys aren't going to be making a Super Bowl anytime soon. And as a diehard Cowboys fan, I had to laugh a little bit and cry a little bit too. So I remember the 90s when when we dominated. And um, unfortunately, I think I'm going to be more like a Bengals fan going forward where it maybe takes the rest of my life for this to happen again. So um, there was some interesting, you know, we did have some articles this week. Pebblebrook Hotel Trust CFO Raymond Martz 
uh, was quoted and said he doesn't believe they'll be sold out, but he's expecting $800 room rates uh, at the REITs 9 luxury hotels. Wall Street Journal had another article, Kevin Escoto, the general manager of the Doubletree uh, by Hilton LA, uh, Commerce is expecting to fill up, but he did lower the hotel's minimum stay requirement uh, to three nights from five and reduced rates slightly from three to $400. So there is going to be a, a quantifiable impact there, but they're still probably achieving higher than normal rates, probably significantly higher. So it's not as good as it could be, but I don't think they're going to be complaining in the sense that they are still generating additional revenue beyond what their normal operations would, even if there uh, is only one team traveling. Well, by and large, since the Giants aren't going to the Super Bowl, you know, I don't have a rooting interest in this year's outcome. But as I have been for the last two years, I'm rooting really hard for these hotels. And I hope they're filled to the gills. I hope people get calamari and the breadsticks and some after-dinner drinks, spend a lot of money out there, tip cleaning staff and the bellhops generously and uh, do their part for helping the hotel market come back. We do have a bunch of other hotel stories that we'll run through as well. Um, we'll try to run through these very quickly. This one, I, I love this one. This is probably really near and dear to, to Lonnie's heart, right next to the Cowboys. The La Quinta Resort and Club in the Coachella Valley um, was sold for $255 million, values the property at $357 per key. If you include in your uh, denominator, the 617 rooms and 98 villas. Um, the property also has almost 200,000 square feet of meeting space. Blackstone was the seller. And the reason I like this so much was uh, it was the site of one of the seasons of The Bachelor, which, you know, Lonnie used to go and join the studio audience to watch, watch those things because, you know, he's such a fan of, you know, real television drama. And uh, so I thought I'd throw that one out there for him. You know, it's interesting on that one. No, I'm not a fan of The Bachelor. No, I've never been in the studio audience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Blackstone was the seller on this one, man. I, when I see Blackstone selling an asset, I always wonder for, for the person buying the asset, do they actually feel like they got a good deal? Because we know Blackstone pretty much has this game figured out. It's kind of like if the Atlanta Braves from the 1990s were trading you a pitcher when they have Greg Maddox and John Smoltz and everyone else, like, are you really getting the better into that deal? Like they kind of know what pitching looks like. And with Blackstone, it's like these deals, when I see Blackstone as a seller, I always wonder uh, how does the buyer feel about that? Obviously they must feel like they're getting a deal, but it would make me a little bit nervous to pull the trigger. That was a common refrain back in the nineties when the Rockefeller family was selling their commercial real estate in New York, including Rockefeller center and other trophy assets in New York that you know, when they were shopping these deals, when the uh, banks and brokers were shopping these deals, the common refrain was, do you really want to be buying what the Rockefellers are selling? And uh, I, I think that goes for Blackstone these days because they're kind of the, the modern day Rockefellers when it comes to, uh, to real estate. So I agree with you. A couple of other deals we'll run through quickly right here. The Hyatt Place in San Francisco, that would be the Hyatt Place, San Francisco downtown, was sold by Stonebridge for $460,000 a key. Dynamic City Capital paid $106 million for the 230-room hotel. Uh, why do I single out this story among all the hotel stories and sales that took place this month and this week? Largely because San Francisco, you know, almost no business travel, a lot of negative headlines with crime. And usually when you start to see a, a market hitting bottom, it's when trans, you know, transactions in unloved parts of the market in unloved cities start to clear, whether it's Houston or Chicago or New York. And, and so here we have that Hyatt going for 460,000 a key. Two other stories, these aren't sales, but things to keep an eye on. Uh, the Real Deal reported that the 500 key Oakland to Marriott City is up for sale. East Steel Secured is uh, marketing that property. It last traded in 2017 for just under 300,000 per key. So that'll be another benchmark we'll be looking for in the Bay Area. And lastly, Beaver Creek was able to refinance its 2017 uh, CMBS loan. The Park Hyatt Beaver Creek Resort and Spa owned by Bramer Hotels and Resorts refinanced into a floating rate loan at SOFR plus 286. 
So 286 basis points over the new LIBOR. The new loan is for two years with extension options that can extend the loan to as long as five years. The collateral contains 190 keys in Beaver Creek, Colorado. And what this means is that two 2017 loans totaling almost 90 million will be paid off in the near term. So last week, we spent quite a bit of time talking about Houston and green shoots that were a positive sign from that city. We are going back to Houston this week with another story. And my question, Lonnie, is, is it a green shoot or is it crabgrass? What if I said it's a hedge? Nice. <laughs> um, I think it depends on how you look at it. I mean, I, I would say, let me give a little context to this. This is uh, the three Westlake Park office building in Houston. It's built in 1983, renovated in 2005. It's 19 floors, about 420,000 square foot of net rentable. Uh, had the likes of BP and ConocoPhillips as long-term tenants. They vacated the property within the last few years. So now it's been sitting vacant for some time. So if you were to take the, uh, the green shoot approach uh, to this, you would say, uh, yeah, somebody's going to buy this at a really low basis and have the ability to reposition it and, uh, and potentially make out really well on the back end of this. On the crabgrass side, you know, effectively, you have a property that at origination in 2014 was valued at $121 million, about $288 a square foot. And per the listing agreement, the notes and the commentary in our system, there was a, a recent appraisal in December of 2020 at about 25 million. And I believe on the auction platform, the, the minimum bid was around 7 million. So if you assume the property traded for that 25 million range uh, where the appraisal was, it's about $60 a square foot. So another, you know, Houston vacated office, 400 plus thousand square feet at $60 a square foot. It's not great news on the whole, but for this individual asset, I did read where this potentially has opportunity to be converted to maybe a multifamily use. It's in the, uh, the energy cor corridor. And just for some context um, at origination, this wasn't outlandishly valued at the $121 million figure, which was around 288 a foot. Four of the comps that were used in the appraisal at the time of the origination, uh, Waterway Plaza 1 and 2 was valued at $340 a square foot. West Chase Park was at 306. Plaza at Enclave was 312. And Energy Center 2 was around 305. So this was about $40 a square foot lower than the average sales price transaction in that market when it was originated. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think what we're seeing here, though, is that Houston is coming back. Um, some of these properties that would have been untouchable over the last 18 to 24 months due to uh, oil, due to, due to the, uh, the COVID pandemic. We're starting to see, as Mana said, some of this stuff clear out now, and it'll be interesting to see what they do with this building. I'll, I'll bring up two things about this. First, a little bit of tooting our own horn here. This is a story that we were following at Tripwire long before BP and Conoco ever left. And, and I like to, for our listeners, periodically, and hopefully not too often, toot our horn in the sense that we were able to give CMBS investors a two to three year head start that this was a loan that was going to be potentially a source of concern. And now five years later, five years since we brought this loan up the first time to our readers, that loan is now looking at probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a $50 million loss, depending on where this thing clears. You know, if we assume that it clears close to what the value was in December, that low $20 million number, then what you're talking about for this thing is, well, actually, there's about $16 million in unpaid service or advances that will have to get paid out of whatever recovery this is. This is going to be end up being a $70 million loss when all is said and done. And what that is going to do is it is going to wipe out the first loss bond in a 2014 deal, and it's going to wipe out the second loss bond and probably all or most of the third loss bond. So what you're up to at that point is you've wiped up credit protection up to the original double B minus in that particular deal. And if you were a trader or an investor or something like that, and you knew this a couple of years ahead, this was an opportunity for you to get out of double Bs and triple Bs in the securitization ahead of Conoco and BP ultimately vacating the premises. So 
my own pat on the back for the TREP research team. We also had a number of office moves that take us from Boston through New York City. Yes, it seems like, you know, the, one of the back of those t-shirts that they sell at the Bruce Springsteen concerts, right? Where they say, you know, Pittsburgh and East Rutherford and Washington, D.C. and Phoenix and all this other stuff. We'll run through these very quickly. I love all of these because anytime you see somebody taking on more square footage, or even if they're renewing for the same amount of square footage, it means that they're believing that the back to the office narrative is the one that will take place. So with no further ado, Cambridge Associates looks like they're going to be moving from 170,000 square feet at 125 High Street in Boston to about 120,000 square feet at the underdevelopment Winthrop Center in Boston. So a bit of a downsizing, but I'm sure that that Winthrop Center is probably class AAA in terms of amenities and so forth. I know it's a very environmentally friendly building. building. Move-in is slated for 2023. Millennium Partners is doing that. So Cambridge Associates on the move there. In Pittsburgh, we got a report from the Pittsburgh Business Times that Citizens Bank is on the hunt for new offices. Uh, the bank currently has 100,000 square feet at 525 William Penn Place. The bank hopes to make a decision later this year. Uh, Pittsburgh brokers start your engines. In Chicago, Morningstar looking for 250,000 square feet in the loop. This comes from Cranes Chicago's Danny Ecker. Uh, he's one of my go-to guys every week in terms of office stories. He and Abby Gallum in that uh, Crane Chicago office both do a great job and are among my favorite reads for the week. Uh, it seems like in that particular story, the Marshall Field building in the loop is the leading candidate right now. But nonetheless, Chicago brokers, start your engines. Uh, the Real Deal reports that Santander will be moving its New York City office. The bank signed on for 160,000 square feet at 437 Madison in Midtown. Um, the bank is taking the space from WeWork. Uh, asking rents were 90 bucks a square foot there. Santander is currently at 45 East 53rd. And lastly, according to the Atlanta Business Chronicle, McKinsey is looking for an additional 50,000 square feet uh, in Atlanta. They already have about 65,000 square feet at 725 Ponce. They're looking to almost double that as they grow in that hot Atlanta part of the country. And normally we do shout outs uh, toward the end, but I did want to give a shout out to Joe D who highlighted the latest news about the beleaguered American dream mall. Yes. Beleaguered is the word it's, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's one of these things where when you have too much hubris, it never works out well, right? When they made the Titanic, what was that famous quote? right? Not even God can sink this boat or something like that when they made it. Unsinkable, they called it. Unsinkable. And uh, we all know how that ended. You know, this property, the Dream Mall, which, you know, in and of itself has an awful lot of hubris, right? Is there, has there ever been a Dream Mall, right? The mall is an obligation. It's, it, it's not Shangri-La, but it used to be on Xanadu. So, you know, that fabulous mythical place that everybody wants to be, um, and, and look how this is turning out. But I believe it was uh, old friend Lauren Thomas of CNBC who broke this story. Uh, she's been on fire lately. She also broke the Peloton story that the reserve fund, the interest rate, the interest reserve that was paying debt service on the dream while they were ramping up the tenant base has been reduced to $820. That's not... 8,200, it's not 820,000. It's basically petty cash is what's left. The owners are looking to uh, negotiate an extension for this, try to buy some more time. But I got to be honest, you know, it's not a great location. It's a terrible time to be betting on malls. And, you know, it's, it's just, it seems like it's going to be a slog for those, those owners. Oh, sorry, Martha. I was I was googling some of those words that Manish used, um, trying to figure out what they meant. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I I think this one here. I mean, it's it's got bad joke written all over it. The American nightmare. Um, it's just not it's just not panned out. Not 
I don't know if more time is what's needed. I don't think there's there's a rescue package coming here. But you know, the, the one parenthetical for all this is, and our listeners may recall this, is the owners. Th this has has gone through many levels of ownership, right? Where I think we're on to number four at this point, and the last owners, and, and I forget their name. It'll come to me, but they had pledged forty nine percent equity interests in the West Edmonton Mall and in the Mall of America, which they have lost. They had forfeited this, and now the, the Dream Mall is basically owned by those original lenders, and, and they're trying to make a go of this. And it is a sad story. It was something that, it's not in a great part of New Jersey, very industrial, on the lower part of the economic scale. Had this worked out, it would have been a great thing for that area in terms of uh, building up the economic base, creating jobs, really revitalizing perhaps that whole part of East Rutherford and Secaucus and so forth. And instead, what you may end up left with is an eyesore that you can't even get rid of. And, and that would be kind of the complete opposite of what you want for that neighborhood. You want, you know, inbound, not kind of things that have to be raised. So, but time will tell. And and just like with the hotels, I, I root really hard for these guys. And uh, regardless of my personal opinion of, of where it is and what it looks like, I, I do hope they make a go of it. I hope it works. Turning to multifamily, that sector has seen demand that's strong in many metro areas. And we're going to walk through some recent transactions that offer benchmarks across a number of these metro areas. So last week, we talked about a record-setting uh, Nashville apartment sale, you might recall the one at 1200 Broadway, uh, Intercontinental Real Estate bought it for 300 million, has 300 apartments and 66,000 square feet of offices, which represented about $600,000 per apartment, which crushed the previous record for multifamily. We've seen several other stories in the U.S. this week that have the quote unquote record breaking adjectives in front of them. Yes. Let me run through a few of those here, Manus. We have uh, 1500 Locust in the Rittenhouse Square neighborhood of Philadelphia traded at 381,000 per unit. 612 unit complex was sold by Bearings for about 233 million. It's reported to be the biggest sales price for a Philadelphia apartment complex. Uh, Newmark represented the seller on that transaction. If we shift down to North Carolina and Durham, uh, Blue Heron Asset Management sold 164 unit Foster on the Park property for a new record price in terms of price per apartment. Mixed use property was sold for 78 million uh, or 477,000 per apartment. The buyer was Stockbridge. Northmark handled the sale on that one. I think what's interesting here is just like uh, we've been seeing in every offering memorandum, value add has to be part of the broker's package. When it actually sells, record has to be part of the price. Yorba Linda, California, Interstate Equities Corporation acquired 400-unit Bryant at Yorba Linda for almost 515000 per apartment. The Commercial Observer reports that this is the largest sale in 2022 for California multifamily at a, at a price of about $206 million. And then finishing up here, uh, Austin apartment prices keep going up. We've talked about this over the last couple of podcast episodes. 300 unit Pioneer Hill property on Edgeworth Bend just sold for 500,000 per apartment. Compte Capital paid 150 million for the complex and ICI Residential was the seller. Uh, so there's four stories, just quick hitters, um, all of them effectively setting record prices on a per unit basis and all of those sales prices significant uh, in terms of total, uh, total allocation. It'll be interesting to see what this uptick in rates this week does, if anything, to cap rates, right? We've seen some cap rates, you know, crack that 3% level, right? You're getting into the, the high twos at times, certainly plenty, probably more than the eye can see at under three and a half. And uh, it, it'll be interesting to see now that we have that two year uh, at 160 and that 10 year at 205 and maybe on their way higher, if this does anything to dampen the appetite that we've seen for multifamily for the last two years, because it has been insatiable. 
It's incredible. I mean, across all the markets, you, you drive through any of the major metropolitan locations in the U S and there's more apartment construction going on now than I think we've seen since the 1980s. And the part that just seems a little illogical is just that we've been able to fill all of those apartments as they've come online. So I remember I started my career back in property management for multifamily and there was ebbs and flows in the marketplace. I mean, as new supply came on, the older stock uh, suffered in terms of occupancy, rent concessions, lower rents. And we just haven't seen that here, at least in the major metros. And these prices are just, uh, you know, considered to be outlandish, but that's what the market is. And I'll say, I don't know that rates will directly impact it, at least in the short term. There's so much available capital on the sidelines that people are going to place the capital. Um, and I think apartments, if you look on a relative basis across the asset classes, would probably, with the exception of maybe industrial, would be perceived as probably the safest place to put your money. So it'll be very interesting to watch. Um, this is one of those things where cash flow or the, the inbound capital can, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, overpower the fundamentals in some instances. Uh, one programming note and reminder, our team, including Lonnie here, will be at uh, the NBA multifamily event in sunny San Diego starting this weekend. So he'll be there from February 13th through 16th. So stop by, say hello, and, uh, and Lonnie will give you a t-shirt uh, via our marketing team here. Let me throw in something else on that as well on the NBA. Old friend Don Sheets who has been on our podcast a couple of times. Um, he will be a panelist at, let me look this up here, Tuesday, February 15th at 9.45 in the morning. And I always find him to be one of the more interesting panelists. He often takes a very contrarian view to what people are seeing in the market. Uh, always comes very richly loaded with data. And if you happen to be out in San Diego at this conference and you have an opportunity, you know, that would be the session that I would try to jump in on because he gives a, uh, just a very insightful presentation and, and whenever he does, I try to catch them. And if you listened last week, we gave a shout out to three dog night, a listener alias, not the group again. And Lucius C, an observant listener pointed out that Manus's knock three times reference was indeed a Tony Orlando and Dawn reference and not a three dog night one, which we kind of knew that after the fact, but. I think Lucius has corrected me twice on my song things. He has yet to comment on any kind of things about cap rates or sales per square foot or anything else. I, I think that he spends his time on, uh, you know, music trivia sites and uh, looking for ways to tweak me. And he certainly did this week. Before you get into a couple of others, I will throw out two of my own shout outs, Martha. One is to the guys at BMO. They recently added a securitization team, old friend of ours who goes back with us decades. Mary Kunka is the lead structurer there. They brought their first deal to market today. It priced. Congratulations to them. Getting that first one done is, is always the hardest, and I hope it leads to many other uh, deals, many other profitable deals for them. And I will throw this shout out out as well. I've talked about before uh, Trep's experience working with BlackRock when they owned us in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I saw a press release this week that their chief risk officer, Ben Golub, would be stepping down. I believe Ben was the sixth person hired by BlackRock. And for several years, he was our acting CEO here at Trep. And of my entire multi-decade career, there has never been anybody who has taught me more about real estate, risk, bond investing, and life than Ben Gollum. Just a uh, tremendous leader. Uh, when he came in here, it was like coming into a football team that had really precocious athletes, a lot of talent, a lot of eagerness, and a real desire to win. And he was the guy that came in and here and taught us how to win. And uh, it was nice to see him riding off to the sunset. And I hope his retirement is lots of uh, exotic vacations on sandy beaches. Well, with such a serious shout out, Manus, I shudder to continue with this very uh, 
trivial one. Susie S was responding to your question of, if you remember, we were talking about the the big brouhaha between Neil Young and Spotify and Joe Rogan of who would leave their music behind on Spotify uh, rather than uh, kicking the Tripwire podcast to the curb. And Susie's submission was David Hasselhoff, very big in Germany, Eddie Murphy, My Girl Wants to Party All the Time, and the 1985 Chicago Bears Super Bowl Shuffle. So those were pretty good. And I got to say, I was actually surprised to see that Neil Young was ranked 783 on the Spotify playlist, which was pretty low. I'm going to come back to Susie. And this is the honest to God truth that Eddie Murphy's My Girl Wants to Party All the Time was on my list of things to bring up in the last podcast. And I thought nobody would know the reference. They would know the actor, but not the fact that he made a single back in the 80s. So Susie and I are of uh, a common way of thinking. Mine, particularly common. Well, or in the same demographic, perhaps. <laughs> and then a few more uh, maneuver why uh, Louis B, Pinock P, Troy J, many of them requested our hotel data and uh, thanked us for sharing that with them. And, and then in closing, you know, Lonnie, I'm going to tell you that I know they say everything's bigger in Texas. And I'm, you know, we'll leave it at that, but I just want you to know, we entered you in a contest sponsored by Hormel. The grand prize is a chili cheese keg that holds more than a thousand servings of chili cheese. And in case you're wondering, that's about 15 gallons of hot cheese dip. And if you win, it's going to show up at your house on Sunday for your friends and family. So I don't know if that makes us friends or frenemies, because that sounds pretty <laughs> disgusting. And I hope it maybe comes with uh, an outside, uh, you know, usable porta potty, because uh, a thousand, a thousand servings or fifteen gallons of hot Hormel chili cheese keg dip uh, does not sound that appealing. No offense to uh, the folks at Hormel; I'm sure this is a great. Uh, that was great genius marketing. Offering. <laughs> hey, listen, if I had to choose between that. For the rest of my life, or Melba toast and nothing more, <laughs> it would be Melba toast. Like, <laughs> you know, that stuff that they pour on at Madison Square Garden on those nachos, that yellow stuff, <laughs> right? This is what it sounds like. Yes. And like, I would commit myself to a life of eating Melba toast before I committed myself to ever having to dip my, my chip into that yellow stuff. It would definitely be an interesting keg stand exercise. So with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keen. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, a comment, or anything else you want to share, send it to podcast at prep.com and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your pods. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs> <laughs>